So uh, as I see right here, uh, we are just right over 10 o'clock. So let's go ahead and get started today. Uh, we have a, a, a fine presentation from a fine horticulturist here in Brazos County, uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension County Extension Agent for Horticulture. Not a long title there by any means. Uh, Mr. Skip, uh, Robert Skip Richter, uh, uh, years of experience working with Extension across the state. Uh, he is um, previously here in uh, Harris County, before that in Travis County, before that I believe in Montgomery Montgomery County, um, and so he uh, he's bounced around, uh, but um, you've seen him everywhere uh, online. We see him in Texas Gardening Magazine every month, uh, contributing to that. Uh, he's uh, on the radio uh, up in Bryan College Station area every Thursday. So he's uh, he's everywhere, but he's with us today, and we're going to be talking about plant propagation, starting seeds and starting transplants, getting ready for the spring garden, and uh, looking forward to it. Again, if you've got those questions uh, during the presentation, uh, add those into the chat feature, and we will get you taken care of. Uh, stay to the end of the presentation. Uh, if you have to leave for any reason today, just know that this presentation, as all of our Gardening on the Gulf Coast events, will be recorded and will be featured on our Southeast Region uh, Texas A&M AgriLife Extension YouTube page. Uh, we have a library of every one of these presentations from the get-go uh, there for your viewing. And uh, also, after the fact, we will send out a sh very short survey uh, online survey and we ask that you take just one minute to go and give us your feedback on this presentation today. So I believe that's everything. Without further ado, Skip, are you ready to go? Yes, I am. And let me see if it will allow me to share. Okay, can you guys see that? Yes, sir. All righty. Well, we're going to talk about uh, growing great transplants today. Um, I do want to uh, go over as much information as I can. As I started putting this together, I just thought, oh man, this is like a six day presentation. There's so much uh, good information and tips out there for folks, but I hope you're growing some of your own transplants. Uh, this, for me, it's one of the most enjoyable parts of gardening. Uh, especially when it's cool and rainy outside and you can't quite get out in the garden. Uh, you can garden uh, inside uh, just in the anticipation of the season, growing your own transplants. And so I want to talk about a couple of things before we begin. And uh, first of all, I just need to mention that wherever you are in Texas, I'm going to focus primarily on vegetables today, but everything I'm saying applies to flowers as well. Uh, but you want to choose species and varieties that are adapted. Uh, there's nothing more disappointing than starting something and then finding out it doesn't do well in your area. And if you're new to Texas or new to the area of Texas you're in, call your county extension office or go online to Aggie Horticulture. There's a lot of good uh, AgriLife Extension sources of information that can guide you in picking things that are going to have the best chance. And a good example would be tomatoes. Uh, some of the most famous tomatoes like Brandywine, it's a great tomato to eat. But it takes about, I don't know, 78 days, I believe, maybe 80 to, to reach harvest. And our spring between the last frost and when it gets too hot to set fruit on a large fruited tomato is just too short. Now, by starting your own, you could, you know, begin at Christmas and start growing that transplant and get a really big plant with fruit on it by the time it's time to plant. But in general, it's better just to choose those varieties that are adapted. Uh, check the seed viability, if in any doubt. Uh, I've got packages of seed that I don't even know when they're from. Maybe I just saved them in an envelope somewhere. And uh, you can go online and learn how to do the, the germination test. But basically, you wet the seed, put it in a damp, uh, paper towel, put 10 seeds in there. That'll give you an easy way to determine percentage. And if seven sprout and three don't, you got 70% viability. So you're going to plant about a third more seed than you normally would have so that you have enough uh, to, to have the number of transplants that you're wanting to grow. 
And then uh, choosing your timing by backing up from the day when you're going to put that out. Now, we're entering spring soon, and so I'm going to talk a lot about it's cold outside, and so we're starting seeds inside. But there's the same thing that happens in the summer. Uh, maybe you're wanting to start broccoli, and it's July or August, uh, and you're thinking about the fall broccoli season. When you're going to start it inside, uh, there's coming a day when you're going to plant it outside, when it's kind of safe to go out in the heat. And you count backward from that date to determine when you would want to plant. Now, there's a lot of data on this chart, and I don't expect you to absorb it all, but just notice that different groups of crops do best at different germinating temperatures, and they take a certain amount of time, which varies, to grow to a good transplant. The, the deal with temperature is, you know, let's say we're going to take uh, tomatoes. It says 85 degrees. If your uh, seed starting medium is 75 degrees, you will still grow tomatoes. It just takes longer for them to sprout and come up. That's the optimum temperature to get them up and going. So don't feel like you need to achieve all of these temperatures exactly. That's a range, and, and it often is a very forgiving range. As far as weeks to transplant, a lot of that depends on the growing conditions. Uh, if they're growing in cool soils in a cold room, it's going to take a lot longer than warm soils uh, and, uh, would and, and other things like are they getting adequate moisture? Are they drying out a little bit? Uh, and how's the light levels and so on? So it, these are just guidelines to kind of help give you an idea. I will often leave an extra week when in doubt, especially with some things that take a long time, like look at Cosmos, six to eight weeks and uh, parsley the same way. It takes, it takes a while to grow parsley. Uh, and I, in fact, I sprouted some this fall and I was surprised at how long it took. So I might give it a little extra time just because my conditions may not be ideal. The four keys to getting a seed to germinate well and are, are light, a good quality medium to grow in, uh, good moisture content, and good temperature. And I'm going to go through those a little more in detail. Uh, as far as light, some plants require light to germinate, such as lettuce. This picture is lettuce seeds sitting on the surface of a growing medium, and you can see the little um, uh, roots or the, the uh, radical coming out of the end of the seed. And uh, Boone, is my cursor showing up on the slide there? Yes, sir. Okay, you can see the radical coming out here and going into the soil. Here's one that's come out and pushed down into the soil. These fuzzy things, these are root hairs that are coming out. And so lettuce just sprouts on the surface. It does require light, especially light in the red wavelength. That's the, the wavelength that helps it uh, to undergo chemical changes that allow for that uh, germination to occur. Uh, dill, snapdragons, and patients are some examples. Your seed packet should tell you this if it need to plant it on the surface, or you can go online and Google and find out a lot about which seeds need what. Uh, some seeds do require darkness. They don't germinate well in light. That's true of many of our vegetable garden seeds that you would be starting as transplants and, and flowers as well. And then some don't care. You can put them wherever you want, uh, on top of the ground, under the ground. They're gonna germinate if they have the right temperature and moisture. Poor lighting is the number one problem that I've had and that I see other gardeners have with growing a good transplant. We put it by a window. We think, man, that's a very bright window. They should do great here. And the seeds start heading out to find the light. Uh, and you can turn it a little bit each day, maybe, you know, half turn it sideways or, or quarter turns each each day, trying to kind of help. That All that really does is give them a good workout because it doesn't improve the light. It just changes where they're, where they're aiming for. Uh, reflectors can help a little. And by that, I mean, I've taken cardboard and attached aluminum foil to it and put it on the, the side opposite the window to reflect light back in from the other way. Now, that's not going to make night and day difference, but it does help a little bit. And in fact, I even use that when my light source isn't ideal to kind of help bring that light in. Uh, sometimes the lights are coming straight down on the plant and you can bring a little extra light in uh, from the sides as well. And of course, supplemental lighting is ideal. And I'm going to wait until we talk about the growing transplants part to talk more about lighting. For, for the media, uh, seeds do best in a, in a um, 
disease-free soilless blend, a, a store-bought soil, uh, something that contains something to hold moisture like peat or coconut coir. Uh, it doesn't need to have both of those, but either of those work really well. Uh, perlite is, is not the beer from San Antonio. Uh, it is the white stuff on the left-hand side there. It's a mined product. They, they mine it out of the ground and then they heat it to expand it. So if you got a microscope, it, it looks like a little volcanic rock with a little pitted with holes and everything in it. Uh, vermiculite is what you see on the right over here. And that is also uh, expanded with heat uh, from something that is, is flattened to more of an accordion that's been pulled out. Uh, the advantages of perlite are that it, the, the particles are very consistent and they don't break down easily. Uh, for seed starting, this doesn't matter so much, but uh, if you're going to use it in pots where you're moving the soil around when it's wet and things, uh, they don't crush. They, they hold their structural integrity. Vermiculite, on the other hand, when it gets wet, if you squeeze it, it just mashes down to, to goo. It, it doesn't hold its integrity, but it's super lightweight and it does hold moisture well also. The bottom center is, is just a mix of the two. And you'll see all kinds of recipes of these online and how you ought to do it. I find that I usually typically purchase a good seed starting mix and that already has a good blend for that, but you can make your own. Other components of potting media or seed starting media could be things like garden soil, uh, screened compost, uh, or even used potting soil. The problem with all of these is they bring in weed seeds and we're about to put this soil and seedlings in the ideal environment for seed diseases to proliferate. That's warm and humid. And so if you bring this, the weeds in and put the seeds in there, they're going to get they're going to get damping off uh, rhizoctonia, pythium and other fungal diseases. And so if we're going to use these materials, it's OK to do that. You don't want to use too much garden soil because it's heavy. It do, it's not as, as well drained and, and the oxygen levels may not be as good down in the, in the mix. Uh, screen compost and, and potting soil are fine, uh, but you need to pasteurize that soil by killing anything that might be in it. Now, I don't do this with store-bought soil, but used in garden soil, I do. It takes about a half hour at 140 degrees to kill harmful fungi takes about 160 degrees for bacteria and insect eggs and, and pupa and, and then weed seeds at even up to 180. Now, uh, generally, you shouldn't have a problem with weed seeds in your mix, but if you're bringing stuff in, you, you might. So we need to get to the soil itself, not the oven, for example, but the soil to, or the media to that temperature to kill those organisms. So. How do we do it? You, you can do it at home. Be aware, I, I need to say this before I forget, when you heat, when you overheat soil in the oven, it will leave a very burnt earth smell in your oven. And so you want to be real careful not to overheat it, uh, but preheat it to the target temperature, one of those three. I generally aim for 160 uh, because I don't generally worry about weed seeds in any quantity. Uh, and so 160 and then Put the soil in either a large, like a brownie pan, some flat, wide, long pan, uh, no more than four inches deep because we want to get heat all the way to the center. And it's important that the soil is moist, not soggy wet. The more water there is in it, the longer it takes to heat up. And uh, we, we dry soil, it doesn't, this doesn't work as well. So moisten the soil, but wring it out. It, it shouldn't be wet, just moist four inches deep, throw a piece of foil over it, or what I usually use is a turkey bag. Uh, these are made to be in the oven. And so you can you know, put it on a, a cookie sheet or you can just set it right on the rack, uh, but about four inches deep, you wanna poke some holes in the bag uh, so that air can escape. And I usually put a hole also if I do foil over a pan because you're gonna stick a thermometer in there to check the temperature of the soil and you need to be able to get inside the bag or inside the foil. Uh, you don't want to put it right over the heating element if you're using an, like an electric oven uh, because that excessively heats the base. Uh, you want to kind of get it up away from that. And then check the temperature with a meat thermometer or a candy thermometer uh, because that's going to be the guide as to how long does it stay. When, once you hit that temperature, I said like 160 being kind of a good range. Uh, once it hits 160, give it 
30 more minutes in the oven, and then you, you, you're pretty certain that you've completed the process of killing anything that might be harmful in the soil. For me, media for seed starting needs to be really fine textured. If you look at potting soil, it's kind of chunky. Look at the soil in this picture of the media. Uh, it's very finely screened. You can see some flecks of vermiculite in there and, and peat. It looks like coconut coir with those strands uh, also. Uh, maybe some coconut coir in that. But um, the, the fine media allows you to plant at the exact depth. We want to plant our seeds, those that need to be buried, at about three or four times as deep as the seed is wide. And so when you have a big chunky soil, the seed just sort of falls down in there and it's hard to control your planting depth as well. Uh, and also with the fine texture, you get good contact between the seed and the moist medium so that it can help that seed to swell up. And when the root goes down, it's, it's immediately in soil, touching soil, drawing moisture. Uh, so I like the fine textured mixes. Now, if you wanna save a little bit of money, uh, you can just use old potting media, which is what I've used here in the left, uh, fill the, the containers about halfway, and then with seed starting media, which tends to be a little bit more expensive, uh, you can top it off as is on the right with the seed starting mix. Now, the problem in this picture is that's a dry mix, and I'm going to talk about that in a minute, but dry mix is a no-no. Um, another technique that's done is to plant the seeds, and especially those that are sown near the surface to keep them evenly moist, scatter a little bit of fine vermiculite. I'm talking, you know, maybe an eighth of an inch, just a fine vermiculite over the seeds. Uh, light will still reflect down in there, uh, but it holds moisture and it, it helps that seed to stay moist as it germinates. Uh, so this would be just be an example. These had a little bit of vermiculite thrown on the surface and now with watering, it's kind of splashed around. Uh, but those pepper seeds are coming up with a little vermiculite on the top. It is almost impossible to wet dry mix, and you may have already experienced this. It's like a dry sponge. You put a drop of water on it and the water just sits there like a ball on top of the sponge. Uh, but if you moisten it first, give it time to absorb, it takes time for it to do that. Uh, then when you put water on it, it pulls that water in immediately as does a wet sponge. Uh, and so I've gotten in a hurry, not paid attention, and made this mistake. There's dry so soil mix going down on the container. Then when you try to water it, the, the water sits on top, and then little bits of this float to the top of the water sitting on top of the mix, and, and it's it just a lot harder to get it, get it adequately wet. Once the seed begins to germinate, once the tip of that root, actually before then, uh, one, but once the germination process, the chemical changes with that are brought on by the take-in of water, once that starts, if it dries out, it dies. It doesn't have a good root system. Seedlings can dry out, they'll wilt, and they'll recover. Germinating seed won't. So you want to make sure that it stays moist, but not too wet. If it gets soggy wet, it's not going to do well. Seeds in the process of germinating are respiring. They're burning energy to create that root coming out and to get started. And they have to have oxygen, just like we need oxygen. And if you put them down in soggy wet material, uh, you, you can kill them that way too, as well as introducing root rods. There's a lot of tools for watering gently. Uh, sometimes I've used a spray bottle. That's a little bit tedious, uh, but that works okay. Uh, I like these things called bottle cap waterers. And you can go on someplace like Amazon and find them. They are super cheap. I mean, they're like, I don't know, maybe... 50 cents a piece. Uh, plastic, they screw on a two liter pot bottle, they screw on the little water bottle that you drink You drink out of, a Coke bottle, a Topo Chico bottle, uh, whatever you want. And you can water very gently with these. And uh, that's nice. I even use them for my house plants. I can go around and, and uh, without getting water all over the floor, just you know sprinkle a certain amount of water that I want to, to moisten those plants. Another thing that is helpful is moisture holding chambers. Uh, I, I love the salad containers that you get at the grocery store. Uh, you put some containers in there, get them moist, close the lid, and you don't have to water again until the seeds are up and growing. Once they start germinating, you don't want the, the leaves pushing up against the wet lid. I'll open the lid a little bit, you know, and just kind of allow the condensation to dry out, and then eventually that lid can come off. Uh, but these chambers work really well and, and you're going to hear today 
I use free plastic stuff for almost all my seed starting. You can do store-bought, that's great, knock yourself out. I'm a tightwad, so for me, I love these things. In fact, I, I, I shop and I even go to fast food restaurants based on what kind of plastic containers that they have for, for, for uh, germinating my seed. I'll show you some more in a minute. So here, here's the store-bought uh, version. It's got the little nice plastic dome on it and the individual seeds and the six packs. Uh, that works really well. Uh, whenever you feel like the room may be a little bit cold uh, to germinate, if it's in your house, you don't need a heat mat, uh, by and large. But I, mine, I start mine in the garage, and it's unheated. And it gets down around, I don't know, 60, 55, 60 degrees in there, even on cold nights. And that's a little cooler. So I throw a heat mat underneath mine just to get that temperature up. Uh, you can look through all those temperatures, but I can tell you that if you're in the 70 to 75 range, almost anything is going to do okay. So if you can kind of aim for that, that's a good guess. Some of them come with thermostats like this that you can set. It has a little probe. You can see the probe here going into the pot. And so it's measuring the temperature where the seed is, which is important, and the temperature of the medium. Uh, and you can set that, and it comes on and goes off. Uh, you can spend a lot of money on these, or you can get them fairly inexpensively. Uh, places like Amazon and gardening supply places, a lot of uh, garden centers will sell these as well. You can grow seed in anything. The seed doesn't care uh, how much you spent on the container, or it, it just cares about those factors of germination that I just went over. So here in the top left are some peat pellets. You add water and they swell up and you can put seeds in them. You're going to spend a little bit of money for that 25 seed uh, container setup there. It even comes with a little dome, uh, but that works fine. Uh, here's the kind we were just talking about with the clear plastic. You can buy those as well. Uh, here, here's just a plastic muffin tin. Uh, if you go to the grocery store, sometimes you will buy things that they come in a plastic container like that. Uh, and those are great for seed starting. You can punch holes in the bottom or just watch how much you water them. I don't punch holes because I typically set them on things that I don't want to get water on. So uh, I just watch how much I water them. Uh, look here, there's even a Minute Maid milk, uh, orange juice carton uh, growing some seedlings. Uh, so again, the seeds, seeds don't care. Have fun, try out all kinds of things. You'll see weird stuff. If you go on Pinterest, which is not a good place to get horticultural knowledge, uh, you'll see people that uh, knock the top off an eggshell and plant in it. That's all fine, uh, but that's that's tedious, I think. And uh, other than being novel, it's not the best spot to, uh, way to grow a seed. All right, we're back to fast food. These are, this is a little container. I think this one came from some uh, uh, chicken finger place. It was the dipping sauce container. You may see little things like this for putting ketchup in at the restaurant. Uh, I will often put my seeds in one of these and start a bunch of them. And you can see here the germination. This is lamb's quarter, by the way, isn't it pretty? The germination is kind of erratic in this. Uh, but uh, as it comes up, you have all your seedlings ready to go in a really small area. I haven't counted this one, but I mean, there's probably, I don't know, 40, 50 seedlings in this little container that's about two inches across. Uh, and then what we'll do is we'll transfer them over to the container that they're going to grow in. And the reason that I like this is instead of planting a flat of 72 seeds and maybe some just don't come up. And so you've got, you know, 10 percent or 15 percent that aren't up. Uh, you can just transplant them in. Now you can use extra seed and put two per container as well. But uh, this is just another way and it's the way I like to do it. In order for seeds to germinate and grow well, for them to grow well, you need light, moisture, temperature, and movement. And this is a little different list. Uh, certainly they want a good growing medium, uh, but we've covered that, so I'm adding movement to this list. Uh, good lighting is critical. And Boone, if, if you've got some questions, uh, just cut in. I know I'm talking kind of fast because I'm covering a lot here, but um, be happy to answer some. You're doing great, Skip. All righty. A question, sir. All right, you guys feel free to ask questions. Like I said, we got the Brain Trust that's helping out there answering questions, horticulturists from out the region, uh, and they, they can handle anything you want to ask, too. 
So good lighting is critical. There's three aspects of lighting that you need to remember. And, and again, lighting is the number one thing that people do wrong. Moisture is important. Of course, too much or not enough is, is, is a game ender. Uh, planning at the right depth is important. All of these things we've talked about are important, but lighting is why we always end up with crummy, spindly, floppy seedlings that when we stick them outside, they break over in the wind and, and we're disappointed. But that doesn't have to be. Quality, quantity, and duration are the three factors. Quality. Light quality is the wavelength. And here's the rainbow of light. These are all the spectrums that are in uh, visible light. The visible light range is in this yellow bar. It goes from kind of a violet uh, all the way to red. Now there's ultraviolet and there's infrared, but those aren't things we can see. And those are not things that plants care much about. There are a few functions that those can play a part in. But when it comes to starting seedlings, you don't need to worry about those at all. Now, within the wavelength of light is something called photosynthetically active radiation. That's the range of light that plants can use. And we're going to talk about light colors in a little bit, but I just want to say that all the colors have some function in plants in that range. Within reason, all the colors do. Uh, so while you'll often see red and blue lights, for example, those are important for, and I'll talk about why, but even green light has some important factors and green light filters down through the canopy better than some of the other colors. So if you have a larger plant, or maybe you're trying to grow a tomato and have it fruit indoors over the winter, uh, all these light colors are, are important. They have a function, but uh, photosynthetically active radiation is the key. And our light sources don't give us the light range that plants most want. They typically give us a little bit of everything. And, it, and when we have that, it looks white to our eyes. Red light, that's here in the 650 to 700 range, is important for flowering and fruiting. If you don't have any red light, you can grow a plant but it just isn't going to flower in fruit. And I did mention also red is uh, some plant, some seeds need that to germinate. Blue light, that's in the 500, probably more like a 475 to 550 range. That's important in vegetative growth. So for seedlings, that's the most important thing that you have. That's the most important light uh, that you have. It helps support good vegetative growth. So let's talk about some of the ways that we measure light. And I can just tell you that everything you've learned about light, shopping for lights for your home, is not that helpful when it comes to growing plants. And the first thing is lumens. When you look at a light bulb, it says it has X number of lumens. That just tells you how bright it is to the human eye. It doesn't tell you anything about the range of light. And incandescent light bulbs are, are toward the red end of the range. And so they don't have the blue light uh, that plants need as much. Wattage. Wattage is just the energy used. If you bought a new LED bulb or maybe a compact fluorescent bulb, you may see that it gives a wattage number, but that isn't that that's the wattage equivalent. Like this bulb only uses nine watts, but it's equivalent to a 60 watt incandescent bulb. Uh, so wattage is just me measuring energy use, not very helpful. Uh, Kelvin is another thing that you'll see on lighting. And Kelvin refers to the color temperature. And by temperature, I don't mean hot and cold. I mean blue and red. Uh, blue is, is a cool temperature. Uh, red is a warm temperature. So candlelight and incandescent light, those, are, those have a warm temperature. Uh, the brightness of midday. Uh, and some of the fluorescence, especially the daylight fluorescence, are toward the cool end of the temperature. Now, you can learn to interpret these things for your plants, but just know that those are about what humans want. Plants use that PAR, the photosynthetically active radiation, and that's the thing that matters most to them. That's also the thing that's hard to find on a package for lighting. So here's a LED light. 
Uh, it was sold as a plant light. Um, it has 7,000 lumens of output. It uh, uses 80 watts and its um, Kelvin temperature is 4,000 degrees Kelvin, which is toward the cool end of the scale. Lumens are for humans and par is for plants. That's the way that I remember it. Uh, it when you have a, a very bright light, it's probably going to have more of, of light that plants can use, but you don't know what, what the color is of that. One thing I want to mention, and just as a quick mention, it's very confusing because the Kelvin range is the opposite of the light wavelength range. So if you remember back a few slides, when I had the red on the right-hand side and the blue was on the left-hand side, that was wavelength. And so as those numbers go up, you move from blue to red. Kelvin is the opposite. Isn't that nice and confusing for us? So just be aware of that. You don't, you know, it, it's not critical to know all that about it, but, but as you're picking lights and looking at all this stuff, uh, just be aware of that. Uh, and Kelvin is just the, the perceived color. So good lighting uh, not only has quality, but it also has quantity. Quantity is the photons of light in the range that plants can use. How much light do the plants get? And how much duration do they get? When you're starting seedlings, you want to go 14 to 16 hours a day initially uh, for your seedlings. As you're growing transplants, uh, other plants don't need light nearly this long. If you're growing, this is a seedling talk, but if you're growing plants longer term and you want them to flower, some plants flower in response to day length. And so length of day matters for a different reason for them. But for seedlings, we want to give them as much as we can. Now, if you run it 24 hours a day, that's not good for them. They need a nighttime period, but uh, 14 to 16 is a good number. Uh, the analogy that I like to use for light is, is rainfall. You can have a rain that falls out on your property, and maybe it's a drizzly, misty rain that goes all day, and you end up getting a half inch of rain. Or you can have a frog strangler gully washer that goes for 30 minutes and you get a half inch of rain. Uh, so we can't give our plants all the light they need for the day in 30 minutes. But if your light quantity is a little lower, or if the, the kind of light you're using, we'll talk about types of lights in a minute, uh, is not quite putting out as much as you'd like them to, if you just run it a little longer, you can help accomplish that, that light quantity that you're trying to have. Now, I don't want to infer that that makes, you know, all the difference when things are way out of whack, but it helps a little. Types of lighting. Uh, shop lights that I grew up with, you grew up with probably, are typical T12 fluorescent tubes. Uh, T12 is the, the uh, number, uh, the, the number in this, for, for those of you who are, are number nerds, uh, the number represents the number of eighths of an inch wide that tube is. So a T12 is 12 eighths of an inch or an inch and a half across. A T8 is one, one inch across and a T5 is smaller, of course, five eighths of an inch. So the, the kind we, we started with, the T12s uh, are fine. You can use those. I still use those. Here's one of my light setups that I had in the past. In fact, I still do. Uh, and uh, it works okay, but you got to get those things right down on the plants. Uh, they're very cool. They're not going to burn your plants. But as you move away from, let's say you're two inches away and you move to four inches away, believe it or not, the light intensity changes significantly at the plant level. The further you get away, the more it changes. And it, you would look at it and say, well, two inches away is about the same as a foot away. It is a fraction of the amount of light at a foot away than it is up close. So put those close. T8s, we don't use much more, but a lot of plant growers like the T5s. Those are very uh, energy efficient for fluorescence, and they also put out a high uh, quality of light in many cases. You can purchase a pretty decent bulb. And then there's now high output T5s. That's just another structure, requires a little different uh, fixture to put those in, uh, but fluorescent lights are fine. I'm gonna talk about LED next, and I just wanna say that 
you can now buy bulbs that are shaped like a fluorescent bulb, but they're full of LED lights that will fit in a fluorescent fixture. So that's just one more angle on doing this. There's the seedlings underneath there. Now those seedlings are a little stretchy and that's because I had the light too high and I moved it down and I ended up taking this picture. But had, had I grown them at the level that light is now, they, they wouldn't be stretching like they are. That, and I think it's time for somebody to get in there and thin those things. So fluorescent lights, what do we do? You wanna to go to the store, you got a shop light, you wanna buy some tubes. Uh, you can buy a warm white or a soft white tube, and you can buy a daylight or a cool white tube. And if you, that picture I just showed you had four tubes, two fixtures, and I just do a warm white, cool white, warm white, cool white, and by doing that, you take the very imperfect fluorescent spectrum and you spread it out a little bit and it does a little bit better job for your plants. So here, here are those two tubes. This is the data on them. When you look at the package, I just want you to notice the color temperature. Uh, the warm white was a 60, or, or a, a, a cool, the cool white, excuse me, the low Kelvin is a 6,500 Kelvin and then the high uh, 3,000 uh, Kelvin. So LED lighting, uh, here's two types of LED lighting and a fixture I used to have in the, in the kitchen. Uh, by the way, uh, it, it, it did take some, some convincing to, for my wife to let me put a lighting and all my growing plants in her kitchen, but it worked out. Uh, LED is energy efficient. It uses much less watts for the amount of light you get. By the way, I want, I want you to be aware of this, that when energy goes into a light source, whether it's an incandescent bulb, a fluorescent or an LED, it's gonna send out heat and light. The more heat, the less light. The amount of energy that goes in is gonna either produce a lot of heat and not much light or a lot of light and not much heat. Incandescent, a lot of heat, not as much light for the energy you're spending money on. LED, more light and much less heat for the energy that you're spending money on. LED lasts longer. Uh, some, some of them say they'll last 50,000 hours. Uh, I guess time will tell. Uh, and then there's more options. You can buy LED lighting now with chips in them that give you whatever wavelength you want. Uh, and some, some very expensive lighting will even allow you to change the wavelengths in the fixture as the plants grow. This would be something that professional growers are using as they're taking plants through uh, the various stages of growth. LED costs more money um, and it, you can get, uh, when you do lighting, you, you can either do full spectrum lighting, which is an LED at the top of the picture. It looks white to us because it's got all the colors in it. Or you can just purchase lights that are red and blue and you've probably seen these before. Uh, uh, they, they just put out red and blue light because those are the two key ones that plants need most. And so the other thing I want to say about LED is I've purchased some different LED fixtures and it's hard to tell the quality. Uh, if you go online, they don't give you those, they don't tell you PAR, for example, that I said was so important in many cases or they put things up that are just flat wrong, de deceptive. They'll show you a, a light range and, and it, it's not really what that light puts out. Uh, so it, it is difficult. You kind of get what you pay for. So here's the white LED at the top and there's the red and blue LED from the previous picture at the bottom. So there's a certain amount of diodes that are blue, a certain amount of diodes that are red. Uh, and like I said, you can, you can do that in a range. Uh, I tend to do do the white. Um, there's nothing wrong with doing the blue and the and the red, but um, yeah, I just like the, the look of the white better. Okay, moisture. Uh, even moisture is good for for growth. There's that uh, bottle cap waterer again. If you got little spindly seedlings coming up out of there, when you water them gently like this, you don't knock them over into the dirt. Uh, or if you have seeds on the surface, you're not blasting them out as you water. Uh, bottom watering, I think, is the best way to water once you have transplants up and growing. Uh, you just have a tray that holds water and you put water in the bottom and it wicks right up into the plants. If you put a little too much, you can pour some out, but it'll. when water wicks up, you don't have over soggy plant containers. 
unless there's standing water still in the bottom for a long period of time. Uh, because the water is is by capillary action moving up in there and it's it's easy to to water without overwatering. And as you can see in this picture, I'm even adding a little bit of fertilizer at this stage, a little dilute fertilizer to get those things growing. Temperature, the best temperature varies with the species, but uh, you know, ideally, if you've got a moderately warm soil mix and cooler temperatures, it helps grow a stockier seedling. And uh, I don't always achieve that in what I'm trying to do. Like when I do it indoors in the house, the, both temperatures are about the same. Uh, but that that's something that uh, you might aim for. Movement is really important. Uh, plants that are grown in still air develop weak stems. This is true of that tree in your yard, or actually the tree in the nursery that was grown tied to a stake, and they prune it, and they make the trunk get really tall, so you think you're buying an eight-foot tree or a six-foot tree, but it's got a little spindly pencil trunk that is not going to be able to withstand the wind uh, until it strengthens. Every time that trunk bends, the tree trunk starts to develop stronger, more uh, higher lignin tissues that can take the wind. The same is true for our transplants. When we move a transplant, they don't get as lanky and they develop a stockier growth because they're responding to the fact that I'm being, being bent and twisted and turned like that. And the term for it is thigmomorphogenesis. That was the nickel word for the day. That'll be on the test. Uh, thigmomorphogenesis just means that a plant is growing it's responding in its growth habit to some sort of a touch stimulus. It may be the touch of a tendril twining against something as that vine curls and, and grows, uh, or it may be the thigmomorphogenesis that you create when you uh, pet your plants. Uh, so uh, if you get out there and take a pencil or your hand and a couple times a day just brush over them, just push them this way or that way. In a greenhouse, they may have big fans going up high that are kind of oscillating around and, and moving those seedlings and making them experience that movement uh, and therefore develop more stockiness. So if your neighbors and family catch you petting your plants, just tell them that you are undergoing the scientific process of thigmomorphogenesis and get off my back and maybe they'll leave you alone or they'll probably still think you're crazy. As the seedlings grow, bumping them up to the next size. Now, uh, if you grow in individual cells, you don't have to have to do this. But I remember I plant a bunch of seeds in a little container. And so when it's time to transplant them, you can just real carefully separate them like this. Uh, and you always want to lift them if possible. If they have seed leaves, like the picture on the right, this cotyledon, that's a great way to lift them because they they if that breaks off or gets crushed by your fingernail, that's not going to be a problem for the plant. You don't want to grab them by the stem. If you break a stem or squash a stem, uh, it's a big problem. Uh, here is using a spoon or a knife blade just to lift some up and separate some lettuce seedlings out. Uh, and then we just take the cells they're going to grow in and put them right in there. So you may be thinking, well, why didn't I just plant two seedlings in the cell and thin out every other one? That's fine. You can do that too. Uh, I just I like starting them in the little things and then moving them to whatever the container is. Sometimes I move them to a container that's much larger, and I'll show you that in a minute. And uh, by by that, I don't want to just uh, have to thin out seedlings. So how do we grow our transplant? Well, there's all kinds of containers. Look at this. Uh, this is, remember how I said I pick my restaurants based on their containers? This is a Salada salad container. That's the yellow one right there. And it's got more lettuce than I and every neighbor I know needs, but it's all growing in there. Uh, here's the, the salad containers. Uh, and then here's that little um, uh, fast food uh, container starting some more seedlings. The, the thing I like about this is uh, these plants are growing under a light and obviously I've kind of run out of space. But here I am starting a whole bunch of new plants in that little container. And if I had seeded those out in a big flat, where am I going to put it? But they can grow in here for a pretty good while before I have to bump them out. And that's another reason why I like using these smaller containers to get things started. Uh, newspaper pots are my favorite. I, I love them for growing plants because the plants do super well in them. Uh, to grow a pot, you just take a container the size that you want the pot to be. So I'm using the Campbell soup can here. That's a huge container. But if I were growing a tomato transplant and I'm going to 
uh, put those little seedlings, move them into it. I want something larger because I don't have to do this, move them two or three times. Uh, roll it over the, the paper and then fold it over. Starting bottom left, you tear the paper into strips and you will notice that a newspaper tears this way lengthwise, but if you try to tear it sideways, it tears crooked. If you don't believe me, go try it after this presentation. Uh, you, if you tear it the right way, it makes, makes a nice long straight tear. Uh, you just t make that strip of paper as wide as you want to go, as deep as you want in the container, and then wide enough to go all the way across or at least two thirds of the way across the bottom of the container. So whatever container you choose, that's, that's how you do it. That way when you fold the edges over like this and press them in, kind of squeeze the edges, uh, it just slides right off the can and you can fill it with soil. Here it is at the bottom right, they're sitting in a, in a tray of water and look at the water moving up. That soil is getting wet from the bottom up all the way and you can fit them all in here and the roots will grow right through the sides of that uh, paper. The, as long as that paper is moist, doesn't dry out. If it dries out, it'll burn the roots and then new roots will start growing out when it's wet again. But newspaper pots are easy. Uh, you can make them out of anything. Uh, my favorite uh, new thing to make them out of is a pledge can. That makes a good transplant size container for a lot of things. And it has a little domed uh, concave bottom. So when you fold the paper under it, I don't know, it just I find it very easy. Watch out for plant cans that have rings on the bottom because when you go to slide the paper cylinder you just made off, it's harder to get it off that can than it is with something like a, a, a pledge can or or maybe one of these uh, uh, supplement or vitamin bottles or something like that. Remember, plants don't care what they're in. And here's a little basil transplant ready to go out in my garden. Look at the roots that have come out of the side. So I don't have to pull it out of the container. I don't have to, you know, push on the bottom and try to slide it out without ripping it. And uh, you just take that whole thing, set it in the ground and plant it. All that newspaper is just going to become compost for your plant. And so uh, it's a great way to grow. I, I really like the newspaper plots. They take a little bit of time to make. And if you're growing, you know, enough plants to plant an acre, you're not going to do newspaper pots, of course. Uh, but for most of us gardeners, uh, the number of plants we grow, I mean, look in the background there. We got, I don't know, what, a dozen or so kale plants. And then there's there's some greens. Over, that looks like arugula or beets. I don't know, something growing over there on the side. We just don't need that many plants. I'd, uh, one of the last steps, we're almost done, is preparing transplants for life outdoors. Uh, it may be in the summertime, you're growing transplants for the cool season. It may be in the, the wintertime, you're growing them for the warm season. Uh, and you got to get those tomato plants that you're about to plant ready to go out. And the days may be 75, even hitting 80. And then the night times are dropping down to 50, 55 degrees, or maybe a cold front blows in. And that's a real shock to their system. So gradually over the course of a week, move them out into more and more sun and especially move them out and leave them longer during the day where maybe they go initially when it gets about six or seven o'clock cooling off you pull them in then you let them to go to eight o'clock or so cool off a little bit more or put them out a little earlier uh, and just get them ready for that transition don't go from indoors to either the cold or the blazing heat so Boone that that is all that I have on the presentation um, I want to, I do, let me see, how do I unshare here? There we go, unshare. I just want to show you, can you all see me now instead yep. of the presentation? So here's, here's some little containers that I have for uh, growing some of the things. I just started these, uh, in fact, I started these two days ago, and this one's bok choy, uh, but look at the little seedlings that are already coming up. Uh, in, in the bok choy right there. They're, they're doing super, super well. This other one is lettuce and, and the lettuce, is, I don't know if it'll show up, it'll focus, but these lettuce seeds are just starting to send a root down into the soil and uh, they're, they're starting to grow. So these are just little plastic containers like I like to use. Uh, and so then they'll move into my paper pots later on. So I hope that, hope that has been helpful and 
Got any questions? We have uh, one here from from Birdie um, talking about uh, Larkspur and poppies. Um, the fact that these are these are tiny. Um, what's the stage that you would try to separate those out and divide them? Larkspur is not too hard to transplant. Uh, it does. It does really well uh, with transplanting. Of course, you don't want to tear up the roots, but the sooner you move something, the better. The the larger it gets, uh, then the more of a root system disturbance is going to occur. Now, poppies are not real crazy about being moved, uh, and uh, they uh, they just they don't take well to it. So that the same is true for uh, let's see, fennel and um, a dill. Uh, those don't like, I found that those, are, you can move them, but if you don't get a really good root system and it doesn't know it's getting moved, uh, you're going to have problems with those. So it kind of depends on the plant, uh, Bertie. We have another question here from Gene as far as when is, it, when is it safe to apply fertilizer to these transplants or seedlings? Uh, seedlings, when they germinate, have all the fertilizer they need in the seed. It has what it needs to get going. Once it gets a root down and it starts to push up the green leaves, uh, it needs nutrients. Most of the mixes we have, some of them even come with nutrient already added to the mix, but uh, most of them have adequate amount. Sometimes I'll put a little screen compost in my mix because it tends to release better. Uh, coconut coir and peat moss don't decompose and release nutrients. Uh, very quickly at all, uh, but but compost will. Uh, but I will use a real dilute solution. Uh, once maybe I have two leaves or three leaves on the plant, somewhere in that range, and it kind of depends on the plant that I'm growing to, uh, and I sort of watch, watch them and see how they do. Uh, but a, a dilute solution, if you're using one of the store-bought, you know, miracle Grow, Peter's, Schultz's Plant Food, all those brands, uh, the, the color, the green and blue water stuff. Uh, they'll have like a full strength rate, where it's typically a tablespoon and a gallon for fertilizing plants out in the in the ground or containers. And then they'll have a, a very low rate that's like a teaspoon. I'll use maybe half of a teaspoon per gallon when I'm watering my seedlings. And again, doing the bottom watering, or it doesn't matter how you water them with this, uh, just to give them a little bit of boost. But remember, uh, we want to grow a good sturdy, stocky seedling. So when you have really warm growing conditions, less than ideal light and excessive nitrogen, you're pushing it toward floppy lanky instead of stocky sturdy. And so just want to be careful not to overdo that. Very good. A couple other questions here. Um, <clears throat> uh, with the plastic pots, uh, like the one you showed for bok choy, uh, do you make holes in the pots, and how how would you do that easily? I, I don't. Uh, on a on a pot, this is the bok choy pot. On something this small, with my little bottle cap water, I can just squirt a little water in there, and I can see when I've got too much. And that's such a small area that the roots pump it out really quickly, and they're not going to stay here very long. I mean, this this is not enough soil to grow a whole lot of seedlings very far. And I don't want the roots to be so entangled either uh, by leaving them too long. So I just, I don't put the holes in them. You could put holes in a container uh, and then you'd have to set it in a tray to keep it from ruining the counter, right? Uh, but, um, or a table, but uh, generally I, I don't. Just, just kind of watch that. Okay, uh, paper pots are better than peat pots. Prove me wrong. Uh, I 100% I agree. Uh, pea pots are okay. Uh, I, you know, I didn't cover every kind of thing on the market just about, but pea pots are just pressed peat uh, that is used as a container, and the roots will grow through that too. But some people don't like using peat for environmental reasons that peat bogs are being mined and stuff. Other people don't want to spend the money on them. Paper pots are free, and you can use 
you know, you can you, you can just use any kind of paper you want. And, and I use all parts of the paper. Uh, I, I write articles for the paper. I don't use my articles because they have too much. Um, let's say they might burn plants, uh, but um, it, I don't know if that was. It's kind of hard telling jokes on a on a team's <laughs> presentation. But anyway, at least it humored myself. Uh, paper pots are great. They're they're free. They're easy. I, I just don't. It, it, it just if you had a whole lot of plants, you might get tired of making paper pots. Mm-hmm. And once you get good at it. Uh, you can just do it without thinking. It's kind of like shelling black eyed peas in the summer watching TV. Well, that kind of bleeds into the next question here from Clyde is, you know, why not just use uh, paper pots all the time um, versus using small plastic transplant containers? Yeah, and the reason would be with the transplant containers, you pop them out and if you take care of them, they'll last and you can reuse them. I get several years out of mine. If you get a little rough with them, they're very thin plastic and they'll tear and kind of fall apart on you. Um, the the um, the thing about, I saw a question about peat not doing well, and I, I want to mention this about paper. I've never had a problem with paper wicking the water away from the, the pot after it's planted. Uh, I typically will just tear the top of the paper off. I don't know. I just don't like the paper sitting out there sticking up. But a reason to leave that paper is if you have a cutworm come along and they find the little paper. Have you ever heard of uh, uh, using um, a toilet paper roll as a collar around your plant so the cutworms don't cut them off? Well, the paper pot does the same thing if you leave paper sticking out the top. Uh, But with peat, that's a, a little bit bigger mass. And as the wind blows and as the peat pot is sticking up above the soil, there is some desiccation coming as, as it pulls moisture, wicking it up out of there. I'm not convinced that's a big deal if you water in any way adequately, but that might be a, a small factor. Well, and that I, we we're doing perfect here. That's going to roll into our next question. As far as um, the bottom watering, like you had with those paper pots and the trays, what's, what, do you, what would you consider an a- adequate amount of water to have in there for them to uh, bleed up? I'm, I'm sorry, could you say say that again? What's too much water to put into the tray when you're when you're wick f- uh, watering those paper pots? Oh boy, there, there's not just a simple answer on that, but um, the the um, I'll put about a half inch of water and watch it move up. And it depends on how big the pots are, how tall they are, how dry the soil is. I mean, you, 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 there's really not a good one answer, but I put more than you need. Give it an hour or two to move up. It, that's way more than it needs. And then just kind of tilt it and pour the excess out. And if you got a little bit in the bottom, that's not a problem. You just wouldn't, I wouldn't want standing water an inch high around the pots. Right, right, agreed. Uh, we did have a question on the grow lights from Rathna. Um, I'm thinking probably for that, your your best opportunity is to g- go through the recording of this uh, after you receive that and just kind of uh, repeat viewing uh, what Skip talked about, the different types of grow lights. Uh, the question there is, you know, is there a specific recommendation online when you're purchasing a small grow light? Is, is there any specific recommendations? I, I uh, am too tight to spend a lot of money on a grow light. And when you think about the value of your transplants, uh, you know, to go spend $500, which is possible on a grow light is, is kind of ridiculous. Although I guess uh, I don't golf and so I don't buy golf carts. I don't uh, I have a hunting lease, and so <laughs> I guess gardening is a pretty cheap hobby in some ways. But um, I, I would, if if you're going to grow just a few plants a year and not a lot, and they would fit underneath a two four foot shop fixtures, I'd probably go that way. That's that's pretty inexpensive. Uh, if you're going to grow a lot of plants and you're going to need more area and more light, uh, then I would probably uh, shift to either a T5 high output uh, fluorescent or go into a uh, LED. And I think on my LEDs, I probably spent six seventy dollars maybe on that white LED that I showed you. Uh, it's not a great one. 
Uh, when I put my hand on the top, it's a little warmer than it should be, meaning it's not as efficient as it should be. Um, the the two, the blue and, and red ones, I spent about $40 for the, that pair. And they, to be honest, they don't, when I grow the same transplants under the white and the and the blue red, I don't get the the same results. The blue red is is insufficient uh, for what I'm looking for. It's not because it's blue red. It's because that's a cheap blue red and something's not quite right on it. Uh, but uh, I find with the LEDs they're brighter, and so I can move them higher. And when you move it higher, it here's the the way the light goes out like this. So if your light is right down on the plants, you don't have much area that you can grow under but the higher you get the light the wider that area is and you can grow more plants underneath it so that that would be my uh observation and and you just have to decide how much you want to spend uh with a lot of things the cheapest is not the best way to go uh you know cheap pruners cost you money in the long run uh but spending a lot of money is often not necessary either mm-hmm mm-hmm I know that that probably didn't give the specific answer they were looking for, but. Well, yeah, and there's so many specific situations. So just a little bit of research and a little bit of study up on your own. I'm sure you'll end up with the right one. Uh, Skip, I think all we have in here left are a whole bunch of compliments on a fantastic presentation today. So uh, thank you very much. Uh, and we're right on time here for a one hour time slot. So I will, let's see if I have one popped out. Excellent, I agree, Larry. Um, okay, so just uh, go ahead, you have something, Skip? Well, are you gonna talk about upcoming programs? I sure am, sir. Thank you. Yep, I am. So what we have done, and um, hopefully it's not a huge bummer, but at the conclusion of 2020, uh, our committee has decided to go to a two week uh, rotation. So every other Wednesday, we will be hosting Gardening on the Gulf Coast here on our Microsoft Teams uh, for the Southeast region. And so that next presentation will be on January 20th. And for that program, we will have the horticulturist in Harris County, Mr. Paul Winsky, will be giving us a program on house plant maintenance and identification. And um, wow, we were talking about this, you know, since since beginning of COVID, uh, the explosion of interest in house plants with everybody being stuck around the house has just gone crazy. Uh, things that we've been seeing on YouTube and TikTok and and uh, everywhere uh, on uh, creativity on house plants, uh, some basic old stuff kind of getting reinvented, uh, but also some new ideas and plants and some new species and varieties of plants that work good in house. So. Paul will be going over those for us. Uh, we will have uh, Mr. Kevin Gibbs will be facilitating that program, uh, but I would uh, suspect that several of us horticulturists will be on the call as well. So make sure that you uh, sign up for that program on the 20th. We look forward to seeing you there. And uh, and I think if, if you don't have anything else, Skip, we are ready to roll. No, I just want to thank uh, the horticulturists that have been on online with us today and, and each day as you come to these presentations, uh, different ones of us are presenting, uh, but you've got a lot of people to help answer questions and, and a lot of good information. And I also want to remind you that uh, your county extension office has a lot of free information available and uh, Aggie Horticulture website has a lot of downloadable information on specific vegetables that you might uh, want to grow. So take advantage of all those AgriLife resources. Thank you. Yep. And this program, uh, as I mentioned, will be recorded and will be available shortly on our YouTube page. And you will be receiving um, a request to complete just a very short online evaluation for today's program so we appreciate you taking the time to do that without further ado let's go ahead and close up shop skip y'all take care out there bye-bye <laughs>